This is CPX 102, the first precept of the Church. This is the Catechism of Pope St. Pius X, CPX, page 129 to 131. Question and answer 1 through 14. God give you his peace. In nomine Patris, Sefiri, Spiritus Santi. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler Spirit, Spirit of Truth, who art present everywhere and filling all things, treasure of all good and source of all life, come dwell in us. Cleanse us and save us, you who are all good. Amen. And two quick notes before we start. You know, apparently the church has changed some of these precepts of the church, but we're going to go with what the church held for hundreds or thousands of years, and as for most of her history, because that's what was handed on to us by Pope St. Pius X. Also, your Eterna Press translated feasts as festivals, but I'm going to keep them translated more accurately as feasts here. Part one today, the precepts of the church in general. Question number one, besides the commandments of God, what else must we observe? Answer, besides the commandments of God, we must also observe the precepts of the church. Number two, are we obliged to obey the church? Answer, undoubtedly, we are obliged to obey the church because Jesus Christ himself commands us to do so, and because the precepts of the church help us to observe the commandments of God. Number three, when does the obligation to observe the precepts of the church begin to bind? Answer, as a rule, the obligation to observe the precepts of the church begins to bind us as soon as we come to the age of reason. Number four, is it a sin to transgress a precept of the church? Answer, knowingly to transgress a precept of the church in grave matter is a mortal sin. Number five, Who can dispense from a precept of the church? Answer, only the Pope or one who has received from him the power to do so can dispense from a precept of the church. Number six, name the precepts of the church. The precepts of the church are one, to hear mass on all Sundays and on holy days of obligation, two, to fast during Lent on ember days and appointed vigils and not to eat meat on forbidden days. Number three, to confess our sins at least once a year, and to receive Holy Communion at Easter, each one in his own parish. Number four, to contribute to the support of the church according to local custom. Number five, not to solemnize marriage at forbidden times, that is, from the first Sunday in Advent until the Epiphany, and from the first Sunday of Lent until Low Sunday. Part two today, the first precept of the church. Question number seven, What does the first precept of the church to hear Mass on all Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation order us to do? Answer, the first precept of the church to hear Mass on all Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligations orders us to assist devoutly at Mass on all Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation. Number eight, at which Mass does does the church desire us to assist on Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation? Answer the Mass at which the Church desires us to assist, if possible, on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, is the Parochial Mass. Number nine, why does the Church recommend the faithful to assist at the Parochial Mass? Answer, the Church recommends the faithful to assist at the Parochial Mass, one, in order that all the parishioners of the same parish may unite in prayer together with their pastor who is their head. Number two, in order that the parishioners may participate more abundantly in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is applied principally for them. Three, in order that they may hear the truths of the Gospel which pastors are bound to explain during Mass. And number four, in order that they may learn the regulations and notices which are published at that Mass. Number ten, what is meant by the Lord's Day? And so the Lord's Day means the Day of the Lord, that is, the day specially consecrated to divine service. Number 11. Why in the first precept of the Church is special mention made of the Lord's Day? Answer. In the first precept of the Church, special mention is made of the Lord's Day because it is the principal Christian feast, as the Sabbath was the principal Jewish feast, and because it was instituted by God himself. Number 12. What other feasts have been instituted by the Church? Answer. The Church has instituted feasts of our Lord, of the Blessed Virgin, of the angels, and of the saints. Number 13. Why did the Church institute other feasts of our Lord? Answer. The Church instituted other feasts of our Lord in memory of his divine mysteries. Number 14. 
And why have feasts of the Blessed Virgin and of the Saints been instituted? Answer, feasts of the Blessed Virgin and of the Saints have been instituted, one, in memory of the graces which God has given them, and to thank his divine goodness, two, in order that we may honor them, imitate their example, and be aided by their prayers. And then in brackets, a turn of press reads, the universal law of the church holds ten holy days of obligation, the feasts of Christmas, the circumcision, the epiphany, the ascension, Corpus Christi, the Immaculate Conception, the Assumption, St. Joseph, Saints Peter and Paul, and all saints. In many countries, by local concessions, they are reduced. Thus are the words of the Holy Pope. Okay, today we will look at number five and six and nine. Number five again says, Who can dispense from a precept of the church? Answer, only the Pope. Or one who has received from him the power to do so can dispense from a precept of the church. Okay, now we're looking at number five today as well as a couple others, but let's remember already in number one to four, we learned it's a mortal sin to ignore even one of the precepts of the church, at least from the age of reason on. So like seven years old and onwards, we have to hold to the precepts of the church. You know, the precepts are like additional commandments we have to hold as Catholics. Of course, modernists love dispensations from the law of God because so many people today are legalists, but notice Nobody can dispense from a precept of the church except the Pope or someone who has received the power to do so. And even then, even then with those two exceptions, it has to be done via faith, not legalism. Someone validly elected. I'll give you an example of severe legalism these days. After a Saturday wedding mass, many lazy Catholics these days in the United States will go up to the priest and say, can we have a dispensation to skip mass tomorrow on Sunday? Now here's the thing. Even if the priest says yes, he's wrong. Why? Because a priest doesn't have the power to dispense with God's commandments. Now, if someone's genuinely sick, does he need a dispensation from the priest to miss Sunday Mass? No. Why? Because no dispensation is needed, as there is no requirement in the first place to attend Mass if you're genuinely sick. You see how the Church wants us to use common sense instead of legalism? Look, we only have ten commandments and five precepts of the Church to love God back, And, I mean, what did he do for us? Well, he created us and he died for us. Jesus died for us. So let's return the minimal amount of love back in fulfilling the Ten Commandments and the five precepts of the church. Remember, any of the old school saints would say that fulfilling the Ten Commandments and five precepts is the minimal amount of love that we give back to God. Not the maximum, it's the minimum. But we modernists are so far from God now that if you even mention the five precepts of the church today, You'll be called a jihadist Catholic or an extremist Catholic, maybe even by priests. Also, I think that, you know, in a Protestant country, I know there's people listening outside the United States, but in the United States, living in a Protestant country that still barely has some small attachment to the Ten Commandments, we Catholics are either ignorant of the five precepts of the Church or maybe embarrassed to say the truth, namely that these are almost as important as the Ten Commandments. The five precepts are nearly as important as the Ten Commandments, so we need to learn them and hold to them. So let's hear number six again that names the five precepts of the Church. Number six, name the precepts of the Church. Answer, the precepts of the Church are one, to hear Mass on all Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation, two, to fast during Lent on Ember Days and appointed vigils and not to eat meat on forbidden days, three, to confess our sins at least once a year and to receive Holy Communion at Easter each one in his own parish. Number four, to contribute to the support of the church according to local custom. And number five, not to solemnize marriage at forbidden times, that is, from the first Sunday in Advent until the Epiphany, and from the first day of Lent until Low Sunday. And now let's just look at one more, number nine today. Number nine again reads, why does the church recommend the faithful to assist at the parochial mass? Answer, the church recommends the faithful to assist at the parochial mass, one, in order that all the parishioners of the same parish may unite in prayer together with their pastor, who is their head. Two, in order that the parishioners may participate more abundantly in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is applied principally for them. Three, in order that they may hear the truths of the gospel, which pastors are bound to explain during Mass. And four, in order that they may learn the regulations and notices which are published at that Mass. Okay, now let me give you a little bit of my commentary here. Now, Many of you may not even know what the parochial mass is, and that's fine. The parochial mass is the mass that is offered in your parish of geographical boundaries. 
Did you know that every diocese has geographical boundaries drawn around every parish that includes every neighborhood? This used to be a really big deal in very Catholic areas like Chicago before Vatican II. I've said before on podcasts, my mom's from Chicago and my dad's from west of Chicago. You know, Chicago's an example of a city that 100 years ago, you never dared go to Mass outside your parish geographical boundaries except for like a wedding. You were really tied to that place. Everyone from Chicago over 60 years old today, even non-Catholics, could tell you what neighborhood they belonged to based on their parish bounds. So my mom was at Little Flower. She was in the Little Flower boundaries, went to that school, and obviously Little Flower is named after St. Therese. In fact, I once met a Jew on a ski slopes of Colorado who could tell me what Catholic parish bounds he was in from Chicago, a Jew. In any case, attending Holy Mass within your geographical boundaries is what the Pope is encouraging here by him telling you to go to your parochial Mass. Of course, back when my mom grew up in Chicago before Vatican II, you'd only go to the traditional Latin Mass, and there would only be Gregorian chant, and there'd probably be some variation of preaching from St. Thomas Aquinas from the pulpit or the ambo. Every parish was basically the same. Now, of course, it doesn't mean everyone at every parish was the same. Of course, you might fall in love with this person or that person and get married, or you might even dislike some priest for a while. So I'm not saying everything was without drama. But parishes back then functioned with totally interchangeable parts before Vatican II. There was no such thing as shopping around for a conservative parish or a liberal parish. You know, Ross Dutat of the New York Times writes about this in his book, describing how every parish in Boston was more or less the same, that is, namely Catholic, before Vatican II. But here's where I'm not diverting from the five precepts of the church in saying that A church crisis cannot change the faith, but it can change the application of it. Why? Again, because common sense trumps legalism. So here's where we're going to apply common sense to the precepts today. You see, Pope St. Pius X would say you need to go to the parish that best fits your needs, the needs of your family, with the truth, at least while living through a crisis of the church as bad as this. And by going to the parish that feeds your family spiritually, that might not be the closest one. Pope St. Pius X would be the first to put supernatural faith ahead of canon law. So avoiding heresy now from the pulpit in this grave crisis of modernism obviously trumps geographical boundaries. Why? Because getting your kids to heaven is obviously more important than geographical boundaries if you have to spend the whole car ride home correcting the heresies that your kids heard in a sermon. So to wrap this up, listen closely to these two words, if possible, that Pope St. Pius X puts in his catechism. He said, The Mass at which the Church desires us to assist, if possible, on Sundays and the Holy Days of Obligation, is the parochial Mass. You know, I doubt Pope St. Pius X could have imagined the crisis of modernism he warned against would actually go this far south when he wrote that catechism 130 years ago. Parish priests 100 years ago in Chicago didn't spout the errors constantly permitted and even encouraged today from the pulpit. I'm not saying priests were perfect 100 years ago, but I am saying you didn't have to hold your breath for constant offenses to pious ears in those sermons like you do today. So, go to Sunday Mass and go to Mass on Feast, but go where your family will be fed, which is not necessarily the closest parish. Of course, the faith has not changed since Pope St. Pius X wrote this catechism, but I know he would be the first to agree with me. Pope St. Pius X would certainly compare this crisis of modernism to that of the 4th century with Arianism. Yes, in the 4th century, Trinitarian-believing Catholics must avoid Arians, even if it meant driving two hours away to a Trinitarian Catholic priest and avoiding Arian heretics. Please say an Our Father for me at Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis. Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti descendet super vos et maniet semper. Amen.